And with that, Mike, we are going to jump into the first game, which you played as black against uh, Daniel. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was that was last week, um, and yeah. All right, um, I have to tell you, and you will not like me for this, but you're used to it already. I have had a look at these games before our lesson, which is happening right now, and certain things are not going to be pretty. But yeah. uh, I don't want to make you feel bad already, so let's get into it right away. So, yeah, you'll wait. You'll be told a little bit later then, okay. The, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this is number one. So, And this is exactly a thing yes. right, where openings come back because uh, I did teach you openings. I told you how to play this. I told you yes. at least on two separate occasions that you yes. don't castle early, you play d6 yep. and go from there. Best That's an opening line there taught for you. Yeah. And yet, first given a co opportunity, we go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is my opening lesson here for you, that uh, we have agreed not to castle too early because then it's awkward to meet the bishop g5 pin, and likewise, if you can create the same pin yourself, given that they have already castled, the h3 g4 breakout is not really desired, otherwise it's unpleasant to deal with the play pin, should they play knight c3. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's something there for future reference. But once again, this is now the third lesson when we discuss this. Right. Um, I don't know what, what. This is called the. Yeah. This is called the. This is called the Roy Roy Lopez. No, you are confused with Bishop B five stuff. This is called the Giacomo Piano, or the, more commonly the Italian game. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And yep. um, what I was going to tell you here is that I don't know at what rate or what speed you play out your opening moves and how much it depends on the time control, but what I'm assuming is that this kind of game was played with a fairly generous time control, correct me if yeah. I'm mistaken, and I don't know if you are playing too fast or not, but it's a good idea to not to blitz out openings even if you are fully confident, because that way you are checking the meaning of the move even when you know where it is supposed to go. <clears throat> right. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at what happened. Now this, I was baffled about to no end. And uh, this is another important point that I wanted to bring up to you that, have you ever seen anyone ever play this move in this structure? Well, I haven't. Um... Based on, you know, you must have seen some classical games, you've read chess books and so on. And you have seen yeah. me showing you d6, bishop b6 and stuff. So how right. the heck did this come about, is what I'm trying to say, in a very gentle fashion. Yeah, uh, I think that was trying to solve the light square bishop issue and not remembering the line here, playing d6 instead. And so, you know, this is just hoping that, uh, you know, in the future, that that would be a useful piece bearing down on the white king. Yeah, but see, I, I what see you the are problem is incredibly with it. vague. Like, how is this bishop going to do anything there? Let's say I play knight here. Because the center is pretty strong. White center is pretty strong. Like, how on earth are you even going to get this out of your way? And the, well, the, most, the having... most overly attacked square on the whole entire board currently is d5. <clears throat> I'm covering it with three and indirectly with a fourth piece due to the pin. Yeah. This is buried alive. It's dead. And after knight d5, this position has gone from bad to worse. I see. I see what you're saying. And your development, contrary to what you thought, was absolutely not center-oriented. On the contrary. Center-oriented development would have been this. That's when you develop your pieces and at the same time cover the crucial important squares. Right. This is half job at the very best because technically it does develop the bishop, in reality it doesn't, and it really doesn't cover important squares at all. So now after knight c3 you would have been in a world of hurt. Yeah, I see that. You know, what I was, what I was thinking was that uh, I was trying to reserve that uh, bishop on uh, c5 to come back to e7. Yeah, but and see, that, that's already, again, a faulty kind of thinking because the reason why I put it on c5 is because it stands well on c5. You don't yeah, want to bring it back. Stuff that. That's not why you went to c5. You don't want to come back. That's why, see, this is how the mystics build on top of each other. You shouldn't have castled in the first place so that you wouldn't have had to worry about this pin and this bishop would never have to come back at all. 
It's not designed right. to. Right. Yeah? Yep. So, it, it, saw that after it, it the game. It is exactly the problem with making early inaccuracies and mistakes that then they tend to spiral and they build on top of each other and you don't realize where you went wrong and all of a sudden you are sitting on a pile of poo and it just looks terrible. And you go right. like, where did I go wrong? Well, see, these right. are the small bits and bobs that you look like good moves, castles and B6, but not really. Okay, right. rookie one was totally unnecessary. And I definitely wouldn't have gone the knight to d2 instead of c3, d5, but let's not worry about your opponent's mistakes. I still don't like this move. <coughs> and I'm really strongly um, against it. You know, to tell you the truth, me too. I just didn't uh, see an, uh, uh, another way. I was, you know, I was just trying to open up the center. So. Okay, so uh, your intentions were to play for d5, and I kind right. of do agree with that. Having said that, it's going to be next to impossible to pull it off even after bishop e7. Yeah, yeah, I, I found that out too. <laughs> Right, so it ain't gonna happen because, yeah, this very clumsy setup, this allows a lot of the things that you could normally do without any dramas. Like, I can't wait for you to play d6, except as a result of this very clumsy setup, d6 now is semi suicidal, because after c3, we are getting trapped here. Yeah. Like, this is right. really, really bad stuff. So, actually, this probably was a good or an acceptable move, even though concept of going backwards is just really, really not cool. Okay, yeah. so we went d5. Were you aware of the fact that it lost a pawn by force? <laughs> yeah, I mean, after I played it, yeah. And then, okay, so that's a no. No, I didn't at the time. Right, so where I'm lost here is that you need to look at two captures, one, two, or actually three, and one of them immediately clears that you're gone. Yeah. Like that's yeah. not a move calculation, that's a half move. Right. And you see that you take back, they take me, we're gone. Uh, and right. then you actually go into the other line, which is a tad longer, that takes, takes, we take back, and again, we're gone. Like right. Even again, the time control mic, this can't get past you. It's, it's impossible. The only thing you need to calculate here is captures, and you didn't do that. Right, right. So that's unreal. You play the move that, if it, if sound, is going to grant you at least equality, but quite likely a better position. When you're about to make such a call, you need to calculate everything down to the last detail. And here, calculation is super easy. It's I take, yeah. they take, I take, they take, and then you count the wood on the board. That's it. Uh, right. And actually, we blundered both ways, because even this one is quite painful, because you can't take back with the queen, not that it would be anyway, but you're just dropping this dude. Carry on. Yeah. Uh, I just remembered how long this game was and uh, how many times this happened along, so I need to speed up a bit. Okay, so okay. took with the queen, creating a main threat. Now G, uh, okay, you went, okay, yeah, I don't mind this. I probably would have preferred already uh, redirecting that knight onto these squares. Um, but probably now G6 would be followed up with okay, yeah, so we'll go from here. A4, A6, so I'm glad that we noticed the skewer there. Yeah. That's good stuff. Knight G6. Yeah, I don't mind. Knight G6, I was wondering if Knight F5 was a better way to go about the same thing because it allows you to come from the center. So, yeah, I mean, here I just saw that he could do C3, and then I didn't really have a, you know, then I was wondering where, you know, that knight was unsupported. Yeah, you know that's what I mean? fair. That being said, even here after Queen G6, you seem to have a bit of uh, an unpleasant pressure. Yeah. As a result of this. But yep, yeah, I'm cool with Knight G6. Bishop back. Knight E5. Fine. Rook E3. Queen G6. Hallelujah. We are winning. Take, take. Queen F5. I quite like this move. Um, King H2. And uh, Mike to play and win. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. <laughs> no, it did not. It yeah. Did not. And I have read the comments here, but the funny thing is that you didn't even uh, need to see that his next move was Rook G1 because really, 
I mean, in one sense, you need it, dude, really, because that's the only move that makes sense. But also, this is by far the most logical defending move. It's not an attacking concept in the given scenario because they are on the verge of getting mated. So they need to defend themselves. And none of these pieces are capable of covering up the king. So it's yeah. a total no-brainer that you don't want this to participate in the defense. So yeah. all you needed to do was squeeze in a tiny little check which, by the way, you have given two exclamation marks in your comments, it deserves none. Because it's yeah. just simply the only sensible move on the board. And it was my second choice. <laughs> it, it's nothing fancy, it doesn't give any material away, it, it's a blunt check that just gives you a forced mate. There is nothing brilliant about it. Yeah. I hate to be the bubble burster here, but nah. It's just a play, literally a playing out of forced winning sequence. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Really King G to Bishop F3. That's all you needed to see. And the rook can't take because of the pin. Yeah. Tactics. Yeah. Tactics. Tactics. End game. And after King F1, you still maintain the pin, so that now check checkmate is threatened and the rook still can't move you to the pin. Yeah. Game over. Instead, we play Bishop F3, uh, and after Rook G3, now you have to go back to hard labor in order to win something here and here yeah you got very naive with this h5 move you needed to retreat with the bishop now so that it wasn't hanging after the very unpleasant queen c3 threat plus now queen c3 is actually not playable because you take there but once again this is already a nightmare from your point of view because we literally gave up a force mate or winning queen for a position like this where you have to play a lot of awesome moves to actually convert it. Yeah. That hurt. That hurt. Now, moving on. Okay, was there anything else left in it? <clears throat> I had a yeah, thought here at the end there that um, I guess, yeah, I didn't like that move either. I felt like I sort of laid down a little bit too much. Yeah, look, you're gone here. So from here on, I, I'm not going to, yeah pick anything. If anything, Mike, what the, again, I would like to avoid seeing is that he, he, from this point on, either you resign or you keep the rooks on. This is not an option. That 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 is basically suiciding with, you know, like you can't hang on with trading off every single piece when you are 55 pieces and 70 pawns down. So yeah. take it if you must and then keep the rook on and pray to the gods that they will blunder something because it's impossible physically impossible to blunder stuff when you've got nothing on the board yeah yeah right. so that 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 is just but we are talking very theoretical here because it's so dead lost that yeah it doesn't really have a relevance in this game all right next um i would like to right now tell you that most of the times you are facing c4 not most of the times but many a time you don't need to think and look at it as a new opening because very often it transposes into d4 openings just like it did in this particular game. Oh, okay. So when you go like, oh, shivers, I've never thought about what to play against the English, more often than not you will find you didn't need to because your opening repertoire is such that you can actually play what you normally play against d4 against c4. Okay. So, knight c3, e6, well, just for the record, e6 indicates to me that you want to play either some Nimzo setup or some Queen's Gambit setup, right? Right. Because any other case you would play e5. Uh, right. So let's go with e6 as cool, we are going to transpose. He plays a3. Now Mike, when you see this move, what is the first thing you do when you that lands on your board? <clears throat> I think I would like to do something in the open because I find that this move is a little bit too defensive and you, a waste I, of the I love the way how you are very politely addressing it as defensive. I think it's a waste of tempo. Yeah, it, it is a waste of time to, to be very mild. Yeah, because, and this is again, Mike, and this is where I'm coming from when I'm telling you about openings and how we are approaching them. I did tell you this, if you are playing an opening and you play a move that it doesn't control the center or doesn't develop a piece, at least one of them, then you are doing something horrendously wrong. Agreed. So you look at this and you go like, what the heck is that? Now, what is I our did, did. gut instinct to do when you see mucking around like that? 
I think do something in the center. Bingo! Look at your move. And I did, I did not do something in the center. What on earth is that doing for the center, my friend? That's a good point. I I'm full think... of good points, see? So this is how you need to think in your game. There's no shame in talking in your head. You go like, this is rubbish. I need to punch this guy in the face, in the center. That's it. There's no other sensible way to continue the game. It's that simple. Mm. Magnus Carlsen can't play a better movie for black than D5. Yeah. There are lots of cases, Mike, in chess, when it's narrowed down to one or two moves. That's it. Yeah. And the rest is just airy fairy nonsense. For one reason or another, it doesn't matter. And this sadly falls under that category because you fail to punish your opponent. Now, is this a bad move? By no means. But in my book, everything that is not the best here is bad. Because right. the opponent is giving it to you on a platter saying, you know what, you can take the initiative as black on move three. And you go like, I, I, thank you, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm good. So here D5 is a no-brainer. And after D4, essentially what has happened is that we are playing a Queen's Gambit decline, which is one of the best, most often played opening in history of chess against D4. And in this position where almost everybody under the sun either plays Bishop G5 or Knight F3, they play A3. Oh, I see. Wow, man. You are coming at me hardcore, eh? Mm. Now, you can't really refute it as such because A, you are black, and B, whilst it's utterly useless, it's not damaging white the same way how this would, or this would, or this would. Yeah? So, yeah. in many, many structures, it fits in quite well. It's just totally a waste of time and ill time, too. But your response to it is not really showing that you want to punish them for their poor opening play. And sadly That's for you, now we actually transpose into a main theoretical line of the Queen's Gambit declined, where A3 actually does fit the bill perfectly well because it restricts you from getting the bishop to B4. And sadly for you, on this diagonal, the only, only other approachable or accessible square, rather, is E7, which is not exactly a Mona Lisa painting when it comes to beauty. So yeah. it's well worth for white to chuck in that extra move in order to prevent bishop b4 especially because it means that later on white can quite effectively play for e4 uh, in many variations. Right, right. Now your immediate response to this of course is d5 for the record, but bishop e7 is still playable. Um, bishop f4 is somewhat unusual here, e3 would be returning to one of the main lines of the <coughs> Queen's Gambit uh, Sorry, the Queen's Indian here, where the idea is that you're going to eventually eliminate this and bite into the center with c5. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, bishop f4 is a bit odd. And now, d6, yeah, this is very passive, Mike. I don't want you to play chess like this. This means that you are going to complete development with this, which essentially means that you have got pieces no further developed than the seventh rank with the exception of one. That's not what you heard from me from the time since we started, we have started coaching, that yeah. opening is all about center, center, center. Well, what happened? Yeah, where I is, see. Where is sad, a sad center? I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Your opponent is controlling it beautifully, so I would love to be you as white, because then I would go like, good on you, buddy. You developed your pieces, everybody is targeting the center, Job well done. Look at black. Rather sad yeah. nature. Now, it's not to say that you lost or, or it's a terrible position, but it's definitely not doing what we swear by in chess. And here you tell me that you didn't want to play d5 because it blocks in the bishop. Does it really? Because the eyes seem to notice a tension here, which you can release anytime you like, and thereby also releasing your bishop. <clears throat> um, right? Yeah, that's true. I guess that there are... Yeah, no, I, I guess I was maybe worried about C5, but I see that that's not really an issue. C5 it can be wouldn't open. even be an issue if it was not hanging for free. Yeah, exactly. For this reference, I highly recommend you to check out one of my not-so-recent, actually quite recent videos 
the push or not push dilemma it's called exactly about the c4c5 oh, okay um but yeah the basically it's just a blunder here you can't go yeah. c5 because it's hanging right so moving on um knight h5 is mm, not bad since you're hunting the bishop it's pretty good rookie one well, somewhat unusual take take now here again i got very very confused you played here rook e8 why rook e8 yeah why, why was rook e8 played here mike <coughs> um i'm trying to remember now yeah uh, but rather than remembering have a look at it and tell me if it makes any sense to you I guess rook e8 allows the knight to go to f8 um, to reroute on, it that hold on, way. Hold on, hold on a tick. So, in the spirit of going forward, controlling the center, playing lively active chess, you are moving your knight on the seventh rank back to the eighth. Yeah, I mean, it's not ideal. And also, I wouldn't, I wouldn't understand why I wouldn't do f6 anyway, so... Um. Precisely. So... Once again, Mike, we are failing here super basic opening principles. Your pieces are ridiculously passive, and now you are working on making them even more passive. You need to attack the center, the middle of the board, and you need to attack it right now, because he is about to develop quite a nasty attack on the, in the center and on the king's side. So can you please have a look at the board now, and tell me what means have you got to contest this center? Yeah, I don't have much. <coughs> so we have to do with little, but I'm cool with that. Let's do the little yeah. we can. Fire away. Um, well, I mean, you know, does developing to F6 now, this puts pressure on some of the center squares. Yep, and as such, a, I quite like this idea, but um, I'm after some even more drastic contesting of the center. Because this doesn't contest any, anything here. It, oh, it, a, it puts a piece on a better square. I will give that to you, and that's good. Um, I'm looking at the pawn breaks now, um, and I feel like e5. I mean, e5 kind of uh, solves his pawn issue on uh, f4, and so I, I'm sort of hesitating against something like that. Right, for the uh, record, Mike, uh, he doesn't have a pawn issue on f4. He has a strength on f4. Consider a strength? Well, can you play e5? Well, that's what I was looking at. I guess not. Well, <laughs> you, you don't guess, Mike. You calculate and you count. You yeah. You realize that it's tagged by 3, 4, and guarded only by very few. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we realize that f4 is a strength because it actually prevents you from playing e5. Had it been on e3, you would be able to play e5. This is uh, not a weakness, it's a strength. It right, restricts okay. you on, in the center, and it grants them a superior wings and the open file. I see, okay. So, well, nope. my other thought, yes. my yeah. other thought is to challenge his center now, his uh, uh, d4 pawn with c5. Hallelujah! Bingo! C5! That is challenging the center. I see. Now compare that to the proposed rook e8 knight f8. Yeah, I see what it, you're saying. It feels like we are talking about two different worlds. Like it's it's not even the same game that we are playing here if we play c5 and we, if we play this. I see. That's totally two different businesses, not even comparable. After c5, there's quite a bit of pressure on them. And they need to attend to what you're doing. When you play rook e8, you're basically tell them, you can do whatever, mate, go for your life, I don't care. When you play right. c5, you tell them, I want to destroy you. Right, right, right. Okay, I see that. Right, and you have to reckon with d5 takes, but then again, even after knight takes, pawn takes, takes, bishop f6, I already prefer to be black here. Yeah. Because now this is actually beginning to become a problem that this pawn is not on the E because now the use of the F-force pawn, although it still denies the knight from coming in, but it's becoming problematic that white can't really control any of these squares with pawns. 
so it's right. not that pretty and if they don't push it in then you will take it which means that the position is opening up for the two bishops right i see right so that's a productive way to go about the fact that currently we have a really junky central control for the record next to none okay rook e8 queen c2 knight f6 very good we need to defend this dude rook d1 h6 what on earth is this what is that <coughs> exactly what is that what is that uh huh yeah mm. that looks pretty dumb now huh it, it, I, well, it, to my my response to this mike that it always does so you will see that every single game we are about to look at, every time you put the bunnies out, they were terrible moves. Yeah. It's because the bunny ears. by default, ninety-nine percent of the times they are. You know, I, I I listen to I hear that in my head, and and uh, and I and I do that that has stuck with me, and I still see moves like uh, knight g four, and uh, sorry knight g five. But and I'm totally cool with that, Mike. So when that happens, right? So let's play. You play C5 like you normally would, which is what you would be needing to do here. Actually, no. For the argument's sake, I'm just going to play a pass move uh, because I want to demonstrate this. Then you play H6, and you kind of laugh to, into your hands too because that's a waste of a move, which will be followed up by another waste of a move. Oh, so I see. you are defending against something that is not threatening. That's waste of time. This is also a waste of time because it attacks something very unrealistic and there is no benefit in it whatsoever. Oh, I see. I see. So happy days. Thank you very much. I will kick you out when the trouble comes. And in the meantime, C5 causing problems on the other side. Right, Although I C5 see. Although C5 is way riskier now that this rook is looking down onto your queen, but I think it's still perfectly playable. But h6 um, doesn't really fit the bill here. c5, holy moly. <coughs> oh, also, w why are you not taking this? Didn't I do that later? I think that was a plan that came by later, I think. Yeah, but there is no such time in chess as later. There is yeah. The, when you can do it, and there is the... You just missed it. I missed it. Yeah. So, he takes... is a total no-brainer too, because after takes takes, this is a disaster. Yeah, right. Especially in front of your king, but it would be a disaster anyway. Right, right. And then right. you just play g6 to prevent f5, and then you just start piling up on that pawn, and you're going to kill it. And the main value is not the fact that you gained the pawn, but the fact that whilst you are doing it, you are improving the quality of your pieces. Which is a very important element to this business, because it doesn't really matter whether there is one pawn, two or three here. They are trash and they are going to fall on their own accord anyway. But the fact that you are improving your own pieces in the meantime is like brilliant stuff. So here, yeah, like imagine you play this instead of eliminating that knight and just launching a quick and very effective attack on the death for pawn. Yeah. Right, so we did do that now and that was a really good way to trade off. Because that way you managed to keep these files closed and this is still really, really weak. Before right. C6, not sure if this was necessary. Um, I would have. Uh, I would. I think I would have started looking at stuff like knight here and then jumping into F4, which as soon as the bishop moves, creates this mate threat. Yeah. Right. Okay. This again is very very defensive. I don't think, Mike, there's anything wrong with taking this, but let's go on. Mm, yeah, this is a bit awkward. Knight e2, holy cow. Okay, e5, excellent stuff. Bishop f5, queen e7. Queen c7 would come far more naturally to me than to put the queen here, right in face of the rook and blocking my own bishop. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, like uh, this This looks super awkward. And the generic rule, you know, Mike, is that what looks ugly tends to be uh, not only ugly but bad too. Yeah, right. 
Right. So don't do it when it looks ugly. See, you ended up on the same square with the temple. Right, right. right. That's right. I remember this now. Yeah, you should have come in here with the knight. That would have been quite frustrating. Oh, yeah. This got a little... Yeah. Because you I need took to still completely... babysit E5, and all of a sudden you are stuck with pieces on the most passive squares in history of chess. Yeah? Yeah. And this doesn't look like something you would be proud of. So, right. yeah, that was the drama there. Now, this is again being played really superbly well, and from this point on, it is going to be quite uh, dramatic. Okay, so this was the first move that I really, really disliked, because I want to make this dude, right? I've got a G file. So, I'm picturing Mike in this structure, my knight here and my queen here. That's what's yeah. in my head, yeah? Yeah. And I, think I it want was to do that, too. like, now, or yesterday, I'm already late, I, I want to destroy this guy in the next five moves. Uh huh. Now you play g6, you block off both of your heavy pieces' access to the g5 for the rest of the game. Yeah. What the heck? I... <clears throat> And you'll, you'll notice this is sort of like a similar situation that happened in the previous game where the uh, G-pawn is gone and the king is exposed. And I, I have had trouble at, I've had trouble trying to find an attacking plan about this moment in the last game also. Hmm. Well, I missed that move. I missed that move with the queen. Uh, but um, but here I was I thought that moving the G-pawn uh, would allow my, my queen to come over and give me some more squares like to play with. I, yeah, I, um, I'm not seeing the I, I mean, extra it, squares. I mean, yeah, you can swing to h7, but that's so far-fetched. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Right? That's, right. That's just very clumsy. But move on, because this is still incredibly super-duper winning. Now, <coughs> once again, this is typical, my one of my favorite hobby horses with amateur players is the defensive chess when they should be going at it like there was no tomorrow. He plays here, he attacks your pawn, and the only thing you look at is, how can I defend it? Yeah, I, I yeah? see. But that's it. Yep. Why wouldn't you go here? Stop defending. You, you have no rights, Mike, to defend anything here. You are a piece up, your opponent's king doesn't exist. You need to attack. You need to destroy. This is like... Yes, I will humbly obey your will. What on earth? Uh, Are you telling me that you are piece up and your opponent not having a safe king, you have to play defensive moves? I see, yeah, right. Not in a million years would I play a move like that. You can't possibly agree to that, Mike. Yeah, no, not at all. I don't. These are crucially That's important things because whilst it doesn't matter in this position, because you have two pieces up and however many pawns and whatever, in an equal material position, this is a difference between a loss and a win. Yeah, I where agree. Is, where is the aggression? Where is the Morphe here, Mike? <laughs> I need the Morphe back, man. I need the Morphe back. Me too, me too, <laughs> me too. Remember this, Mike, I told you this too. Every single move is a mini box match. You exchange punches. If he punched you harder than you did, you failed. I see. You yeah. are a piece up, and he high hits you harder than you do. That can right. happen. Like that. That means that you're about to do something fundamentally wrong. I agree. You need to knock out this guy. Go here. Go here. Go here. <coughs> wait for Agreed. him to resign. That's it. Right. Okay. That that nearly made me cry. Uh, okay, so you know, at this point, at this point here, I remember this game now. I I was running on um, literally like one minute left, so for the rest of the game, I believe. So this, oh, I, thought, this I thought that would have been the case because from here on, you played many, many very pale moves. Yeah, I, I was out I'm of going time. Going to give you a limited amount of grief. Limited. <laughs> limited. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> oh, from now on. <laughs> I, I will okay. turn into the nice dude I have never been. Yeah, okay. So, but yeah, uh, here's I agree. a practical advice to you, Mike. If you are short on time, give a check. It's a really yeah. dubious piece of advice, but right now, because of your opponent's king is so horrendously exposed, 
it's actually a good one. Plus, it doesn't take a Magnus Carlsen to see that after the check, the king can only go here and here, against <coughs> both against which queen f4 is going to create a very annoying threat of queen takes f3, destroying the last bastion of the defense. Yeah. So that's extra 30 seconds. Now you are a minute ahead compared to where you were. And you are actually threatening with stuff. Uh-huh. I have got yeah. a student, Mike, who is a notorious, a terrible time traveler. Every oh, single game is a time travel. <coughs> and in a lot of his games, he gets to positions like this. And then he starts playing moves like this, and this, and this, and this, so that he doesn't lose on time. Yeah. And I taught him a thousand times that when you are short on time, you doubly have to make powerful and threatening moves because now your only chance is to destroy this guy on the board. You are losing on the clock. Every move you make that doesn't pose problems to your opponent is one step closer to your own grave. What problems have you caused? Yeah. Now, so you are still in time trouble and your position didn't improve, which it should do because you are a piece up. So technically, every move we make should take you one step closer to knockout. Yeah, so at this I see rate, that. You are going to lose on time, even if you gain some, because again, now you have to come up with the next whatever move. And since we are not willing to inflict damage and be aggressive, we are sitting there thinking, oh, wow, this is not winning by itself. Hmm, I have to do things. And all yeah. of a sudden, you lost all the time that you gained with this. Right, right. So sadly, it's a very unfortunate truth about chess, but in time trouble, you especially have to play well. Because from right. there on, unless you kill them very quickly on the, on the board, you are going to be a corner. Even if there is small increment, people tend to be very nervous. Like this right. guy can lose a game with queen versus pawn with 30 seconds increment because 30 seconds, 25 of that is going with the mental energy is on, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to lose on time, oh my God, I'm going to lose on time, what should I do? So it's very right. difficult. So you need to triple your efforts in trying to inflict damage. And here you still need it to play. Check, check in, bring the rook in. You need to bring your dudes in, like so. Now, yeah, g5 here was a little bit pale. But um, yeah, we will, I, I will skip to the most important bits from here on. Um, this was a little bit unfortunate. Because here you actually had queen f4 which would uh, open up a fair few avenues, including that wave, hanging the pawn. Ah, uh, yeah, right, right, so right, right. Even better, rook here, but this is a harder one to see. Actually, was it rook here? Bear with me. Oh, no, I think it was rook e6. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, uh, maybe even <clears throat> uh, uh, bishop e5. No, sorry, I'm being an idiot. Uh, look at this. Uh, oh, wow. They can't stop this. Wow. Oh wow, that's that's a that's a nice move. That's it, and it means that uh, they are dead because now this is a a uh, fork thread hitting both. So at least the queen needs to go somewhere. You take here, and rook can't move because of mate. Yeah. So, so interesting. Yeah, that's that's uh, just one of those things. <coughs> yeah. It's one of those things. As a matter of fact, after actually, just for the record, before we have got the smarty pants typing into uh, us that uh, I'm teaching you rubbish, I think queen f3 is even stronger here because it denies the second check on f5 and it prepares for a back rank mate that is impossible to stop. Which is quite a wow moment. But incredibly enough, due to the pin, uh, this is going to be a, a, a mate motif that they won't be able to handle. Like, you're not threatening right now, but this dude is not going anywhere. So from here on, you have got free range to do whatevs. As soon as you bring the rook in, it's going to be mate. Now, moving on, because this I really don't yeah. want to spend too much time on it. Uh, the yeah. last nail in the coffin was this. And this is, to some extent, logical, because you go like, okay, I'm a piece up, I need to trade everything off, I will win. <clears throat> Which is, I'm guessing, is where this is coming from, right? 
You know, I'm, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I mean, this was really quick at this point. Yeah. Now look at this. No, that is much better. That is insanely better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like that. That's it. Yeah. And, and I, I will, I will show you, Mike, how how really cruel this is. The only two moves are these two to defend the mate there. Yeah. Yeah. You go here. Not to trade queens. No, thank you. To end the game. Oh, oh. God, yeah. You don't want trading queens, because that will take forever, you're short on time. No, stop that. We want mate. Yeah. And wow. You, you can continue the cuteness once you are on it, because you realize that this queen can never leave the back rank without allowing mate. And it's not like you are going to continuously just attack it for the sake of it. Eventually, you can change gears and go here, which now inevitably is going to bring about the key one next. Yeah, it seems so easy in hindsight. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but I'm not sure I would have found those moves, though, actually. Oh, look, had you started with rookie four, rookie 4 here with the intention of the backhand mate, the rest is not really that hard. That's because true. There is this yeah. defender, and as soon as you get rid of it, it's mate, so you just keep on hassling it forever. Yeah, yeah I That's see. It. Right. Uh, and I right. don't want to get into the rest because that was quite painful. So let's move on to. Next, next. These last two moves were these last two weeks pretty painful. <laughs> yes, they they were they were okay. So we are going on to this one. This is actually an opening quite well played, very logical. See, this is the type of development that I want to see every game. That's yeah, when, when I try to do it every game. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then you slap me in the face with this. What the heck? Oh, and then I, I get okay. There I, take, is, there is I a guess long, I don't. long story here about why you are playing it. To which my answer is: center development. No, no, thank you. This is not a candidate move. Agreed. That, that's it. You you can't possibly justify this. It's utterly ugly. Agreed. Why don't you castle? Yeah. Which is Agreed. what you would have to do by default because you are fully developed but your king is in the middle. Or why don't you castle here? Which is what I would encourage you to do, but more on that a tad later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I already hear in my ears, like many of my students would go, oh, I got scared about this. I'm like, are you telling me that you are afraid of an attack coming from two developed pieces, an uncastled king, and weaknesses all over the shop and no central control, and I'm supposed to be scared. No, not at all. Not gonna happen. Yeah, C5 is a bit scary because now they are threatening to plug it in, but actually after takes, takes bishop d5, we are fully fine. Right. <coughs> So, and yeah, there were other ways to actually make it even better. One of them would have been actually to take it and then do this. Oh, sorry. So uh, take it and, okay, yeah, sorry, take, I had a Take computer. on C6, back and then castles. And again, F4, Bishop D4, Rookie 1, E5, central domination. Right, right. Yeah, this is, I don't know what. As long as, Mike, these pop up in your games, there is not really a lot of point into getting into opening theory because this shouldn't come even as a, a candidate move, let alone a justified, eventually chosen move. Agreed. All right, this is all good. This is all good. Oh. Rookie one. I would already rerouting this move like a madman, but uh, I'm cool. Here we go, hallelujah. Doggy is number two. What is that for? Yeah, this is super defensive. Too it's defensive. Not def Mike, stop saying it's defensive. It doesn't defend anything. It's not defensive, it just doesn't do the right thing. It's wrong. It's not defensive. It's wrong. Don't call it defensive. You're not defending anything. Here. There's Giving nothing to defend it, huh? and there's nothing to defend against. It's not defensive, okay. it's wrong. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that that is just... I, yeah, I'll tell you why it's not defensive, because you think you are preventing these moves. 
Right. None of them your opponent wants to play. Hence, it's not defensive. If this was a threat and this defended it, even though being a bad move, then I would say, yes, you are playing defensively, but it's poor. But there's nothing to defend it. This is not part of a plan and neither is this. G4 square is not on the horizon of blacks. The reason why he played queen d7 was to connect the rocks. Or if he really wanted to play the queen g4, then I would say I can't wait to see this because then I can kick them out with the tempo whilst connecting my pawn chain together, strengthening my center. <coughs> right, right. This, so let's get into the... It's important, Mike, that we clarify the language here too. Stop calling this defensive. It's not defensive because occasionally you inevitably in chess need to play defensive moves and there's nothing wrong with them. Uh -huh. Here, you're not supposed to defend anything. You're supposed to be attacking, if anything. Rook back, rook back, f4. Center, middle of the board. Okay, I see what you're saying. It's like gospel. Right. And even when you play, if you see amazingly good players play chess, you will find that you could actually justify the vast majority of their moves by just repeating the mantra of playing in the middle of the board, trying to control the center trying to improve pieces. What does this do? Nothing yeah, at all. Nothing. Right. Yeah, okay. Duck, right. Duck. Now, this, and I want to make sure that we understand this, Mike, when this landed on the board, what were you thinking? What was I thinking? Well... Oh, uh, <clears throat> I will be more specific. Is it a good move or a bad move? I mean, I, I I don't think it's a good move. I, I mean, I don't think it's a good move because it it allows me to improve that knight. That knight that becomes an outpost on d5 Beautiful. for the knight. Beautiful chess language there. This is a horrendous positional blunder. Yeah. And one that can never be under, because exactly as you stated, this knight is an outpost. It can never be kicked out from here. Right. So in terms of positional chess, now we are kilometers ahead of them. Yeah, right. Yeah? Okay, now he yep. plays bishop e5. Does this bishop have on the board anywhere a square where you can't kick it out from? Within reason, so don't tell me a7, because yeah, you can't kick it out from a7, but we don't really worry about a7 being an accessible square for the dark square bishop. Look around oh. in the center and have a look at these guys oh, here. Oh, it's trapped, isn't it? But that's a new story. Don't worry about that. I'm just okay. Just with me. Can it go anywhere where you would go like, oh, I hate that bishop there. I hate that bishop there. Um, Is there any square that you're worried about? Oh, well, I'm a little bit worried about uh, d4. D you're a little bit worried about the bishop getting in here? Yeah. Well, thank God we have got C3 on the ready, right? Right. Well, you played this move, Mike. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, so now Not, you I, repeated his horrendous positional mistake. Totally undoneable again. Yeah. So now if I put a bishop here, all you can do is to give yourself a very painful face palm. Right. And the bad part of it, or the sad rather, sorry, is that the intention behind the move was quite right. You are saying you wanted to get this rook back here ASAP and you can't exactly. come because it's hanging. Right. Well, isn't right. it an ultimate case of killing two birds with one stone by playing C3, which solves the problem of the hanging pawns, but at the same time denies the bishop's entry to D4? It does. I guess it cost me an extra move to get that rook activated. And I, I think at this point, I was really trying to figure out how to get that rook into the game. But it's exactly what I'm saying, Mike. There is no quantitative difference between c4 and c3 as far as the rook is concerned. You will have to do this. Well, but <clears throat> but what I was thinking was that... Unless um, you wanted to I'm do not saying, this. Yeah, right, that it gets to be on the second rank. Well, in that case, Mike, although this is a little bit funny now, but you can do c3 and then push the other pawn and come across. So you're still not ahead compared to my version, except that in this case, you actually are going to win the game. I see. Whereas yeah. after c4, I don't think so. Because now, this tremendous knight is quite powerfully compensated by this incredibly tough bishop. 
And by the way, and I hate to tell you this, but what's the hurry with bringing the rook back? Yes, that is the correct plan. This rook is atrocious. But is it really a big drama if it takes me now three moves to get back? How exactly am I going to get hurt in the meantime? Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Have you got a weakness to worry about? Does he have yeah, an obvious target? Does he have some initiative developing? None of this is really, uh, present, right? No, you're right. The, the right. position has gone from somewhat dynamic to very static. After this, the only way how the structure can rapidly change is they chuck in a quick f5, but it doesn't really add too much to the black's position, and you can actually knock it back with f4 bishop here and then take. Even, actually, you don't even have to take, you can just drop back, and it's all good. And that's the only dynamic change that can take place. So while it has been very frustrating for you that this rook has been out of game for so long, now that you are onto it, it doesn't really matter how long it will take, but this is irreparable. And as such, it should yeah. never be played. And now f5 yep. becomes tenfold stronger, because if the bishop here pressing f2, you might have to look out. For the same reason, right. f4 here is indescribably dumb. Because it closes everything that it needed to keep open. So here, oopsie, sorry, wrong button, love you, the chess. Um, so here he needed to play something like bishop d4 followed by takes, followed by doubling up on the f. Right. After f4, he has no plan left. Unfortunately for you, it's still difficult to win the game because the bishop on d4 is going to be a very pesky piece that blocks most of your intentions too. Like, you can highlight he this, but it's not real. This is a dream. Right. Right. I'm not sure why this move is being played. <clears throat> can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, you cut out a little bit. Okay. Okay. It is actually, again, Mike, a very typical way of how the amateur's mind works. Your opponent plays rook g8, and you go like, hmm, g5 is coming. I better do something about it. But what exactly does g5 do? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess, yeah, it's, it's more threat than... Well, I mean, it does, it does uh, threaten um, g, uh, g, g4. No, it doesn't. You are covering it with two pieces. Well, I guess it threatens a, a potential... I mean, I can see his plan. That's right. His plan g4. is g5, h5, g4. And should that hit, it would be very annoying. And I mean, I also... that, are you accelerating it? Or are you actually holding it back? You tell me. Because to me, it seems that you just yeah. invited this really, really hardcore. And now, worse, if they actually have rook takes, followed by a very quick rook double, or even triple, if you will, on the G, and you're dead. Yeah, right. So, you, you said you needed to pre- I guess that G5 is a legitimate concern, I like this move. How? Ah, G5 has become tenfold a concern than what it used to be. What is there to like about this? I don't get it. Yeah, that's, you that's you not... basically opened up yourself to something that they couldn't have done themselves without investing triple the amount of effort. Right, right. Yeah. Now, yeah. there are a couple of ways how you can respond to this. One of them would be to try to do a sneaky queen trade up here. But then again, there is a real concern that you would lose that pawn, so I'm not necessarily that fond of that. You could do something like rook up here and play g4. <coughs> oh, yeah. Note how now all these pawns are blocked on black, which means that this bishop is really sad, and they can never take you due to the queen hanging. So in fact, you don't even need rook d3. You can just wait for them. So play on the wing where you are supposed to, by the way. And when this hits, you just go here. And they still have h5 and then coming to the rook, to the h5 coming. But having this queen here covering h1, it will take for them an eternity 
to hurt you there. Now, what's your plan, you may ask? What do you think your plan is after B4? Um, in <clears throat> I think my plan might be to take C C five and open up the center and try to un um, open up the uh, D file. Uh, the um, yeah, the D file. Uh, consider, Mike. What else is being opened up after this trade? <clears throat> what else is being opened up? Mm -hmm. What else is opened up? I will make it a simpler question. Oh, well, for I mean you, the Mike. bishop. The the bishop is. No, don't worry about the bishop. That's not yours. What do you open oh. up by just doing this, irrespective of your opponent's answer? Oh, um, well, the B file is also. Hallelujah! Ah, so now, what you will try to do is to actually pile up on this pawn. Uh huh. Yeah. That's a realistic target. You have a square here to go to. It blockades the pawns. It increases the pressure that your rook uh, creates in quite a number of ways. It covers I a see. lot of hurtful squares on the six. You just need see. to remaneuver the rook either there or there, and then you can even triple up if need be. Right, right. Remember, Mike, this is another mantra. When you are being attacked on the wing, you need to seek counterplay in the center or on the other wing. You are not supposed to play moves on the side where you are being attacked. And far from me from wanting to be 100% dogmatic, but especially on this level, you need to be dogmatic to a very large degree. And if, right. the, and if the gospel says, don't attack and don't make moves where you are being attacked, but try to see counterplay in the center or on the other wing, then that's our go-to. And since the center is fully blocked by two perfectly placed pieces, the only go-to is going to be uh, the other side of the board. I see. So rook g8, the correct ball move is b4. You can totally ignore right. this because you can hold it back. And that's the exception to the rule, by the way, of not making a move on the side where you are being attacked. But this actually has the benefit of halting the attack for a large number of moves. And then you swing across to the other side and you do your business where you are meant to be playing chess. Look at that. You said you will hold the attack. And we just died to it. Yeah, That's right. That's it. Right. Like, this is just getting very, very messy and unpleasant. Although, that being said, I think here it may have been slightly misplayed by your opponent, too. But once again, I'm not your opponent's coach. So, we are going to <laughs> not worry about that now. Um, this looks concerning. Yes. But um, we will give that a miss now. And so I'm, I'm quite happy that we found this maneuver. Now, what was that? Was that necessary? Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually, nice. Mike, it looks to me that uh, here we are facing trouble. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think you can't allow this. I think what may have happened here that you didn't realize that after knight takes pawn takes, your knight was actually pinned to the queen. I think uh, your only legal move here is to take the pawn. And again, many of people would be scared about this, but in fact it forces your king into safety. Huh. Take the pawn. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with it. In fact, I don't see what else you can do. Take it. Yeah, I, yeah, I rem okay, I remember. Yeah, this maneuver actually didn't. Yeah, this wasn't uh, great either, I think. Something happened. And if uh, Bishop takes, then you can, yeah, start your own business. Actually, here, this exchange stack is far more promising in my eyes, too. Because now this is hanging, and Knight f5 is going to put extra pressure there. And now your pieces and your king, they are all really well played. So. This is not a dream scenario, but this is way better than what happened in the game. Like this is way, way, way more problematic. Most and first and foremost because of this tremendously powerful pawn, but also because I can handle these tricks now easily. Right, right. Yeah. Um, for the record, imagine this position. Picture this position without the queens. 
you could take uh -huh. one here, and when he takes the rook, he would check and take it back. Oh, yeah. That's right. many of the tricks that I can't do now as white because my king is hanging. Right, right, I see. Yeah, so whilst it might have felt like uh, you had something going on with these lots of active pieces, sadly your opponent's pieces are also very, very well placed. Right. And again, Mike, the dreaded queen trade. <coughs> I just can't yeah. fathom people's passion about trading queens when they're lost materially. Yeah, <laughs> you know, after game, after all these games, after move 30, this these are all like running on fumes as far as time goes. Mm, so this is my habit that we need to somehow get on top of. Um, what was the time control in this tournament? This is always uh, 90. Um, yeah, 90, 30. Yeah, you can't might possibly get into time trouble in 90, 30 every single game. You know, because, like, because I don't know, it's because I don't know openings. And uh, so, and to that, Mike, my response is that yes, you are right. You don't have opening theory, but yes, you do have a lot of opening principles to play by. Yeah, no, which I definitely. basically reduces your number of options. E.g., this wouldn't have come up at all. Right. Like I don't know how much time you spent on getting here, but if it's more than ten, that's a worry. Oh, I think it definitely was more than 10. That's a worry, because yeah. you didn't need to play a single move that was not the thematic required logical chess. Look at it. Develop, 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 center, perfect, center, develop, develop, develop. If I really want to be harsh with you, it's two minutes. Two you minutes. You didn't need yeah. to think. What was that thing? Chess principles do it for you. You just do what you are meant to. Openings are not to come up with plans and do some amazing stuff that has never been seen. It's to follow principles. Control the middle of the board and get your pieces out. And that's precisely what you did here in a spectacular fashion. I'm not right. saying this is perfect chess, but this is perfect chess for the time being. Right, right. Anyone no, who... who uh, would have done this under 2000 would have heard, would have earned my hats off well done buddy you're doing what I'm teaching you to do this shouldn't take time right, right. Um, and I'm very proud of you for doing that sadly later on it sort of slipped a little bit but yeah um, I think that your time management is um, yeah yeah I mean it's getting it's getting better but it, but it, it you know especially you know at this point here it's it was for which reason, Definitely. by the way, in case I haven't asked you to do so, um, I want you to record your time consumption after each move you make on the score sheet. Oh, yeah, I actually do. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> that's good. So, for the, for that the record, that when, when we are analyzing these games like so, it would be handy to have the score sheet handy so that when I ask you how much time you spent until getting here and you tell me 25 minutes, then we can immediately address the problem. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, just yep. for future reference. All right. Now I'm going to give you another principle about openings, which you will love, Mike. When we play okay. E4, your next move, you would love to play D4. Yep. Funnily enough, half of the openings are designed to prevent that. And funnily enough, yep. all openings that, doesn't, uh, that don't prevent it are met by D4. It's a total okay. no-brainer. Yes, this was a weird night. Um, I I accidentally touched a move. I I oh you thought it was I E5 thought, or what? I thought it was E5. Yeah, yeah. literally. And by the way, knight f3 is not a bad move, but once again, we are out of opening principles here. Yeah. Okay, you push it in. Not much wrong there. Now after C5, you need to be a bit careful because you would like to build a pawn chain like this. Yeah. And it's very important to build this chain in order to defend the tip of the chain up here. Uh -huh. After this move is being played, this pawn is beginning to feel unpleasant, weak, awkward, because it, it is waiting for its body to come to its rescue, but right now it would get taken, which would mean that it's forever separated from the rest of the gang, and now unless F4 comes from the other side, it's going to be hunted down. Right. So, as a result of this, this is a very rare, 
very, very rare occasion when you actually need to play c3 first, very ugly, blocking your knight in for the mere sake of getting d4 in. Because if you start with d4 after take stakes, now this guy is already feeling the heat. Yeah. It's still yeah. playable, but it's more principled. And I, as I expressed it before many, many times, you need to play along principles. And you Agreed. actually, this does play along principles, and therefore I'm not giving you grief, I'm just correcting it, because this is center, but to some extent it gives up the center. Okay. All right, let's go. Um, so luckily they didn't do that, but now you play for ship E3, so this is where we are missing uh, the link that C3 needed to be played in order to maintain the pawn chain. And of course it does look ugly as sin because it blocks in the knight, but hang on, this pawn also blocks in that knight. Oh, I see. So it's not like you are just playing dumb for the sake of building a pawn chain. It's actually to maintain a quite large space advantage. Because also, right. compare these two bishops. This has got full scope. This has got... Right, right. Look at, look at this bishop. That's all. <clears throat> full scope very important difference. I see, I see. And sadly here uh, the pawn was gone. Yeah. Okay, Queen C2 looks very, very clumsy to me, Mike. Typical case when you are playing a move without thinking what your opponent will do. Yeah, Queen C2, am I not stepping into a massive pin? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, but I needed to bring the queen out somewhere. Right, if we look at queen b3, hitting he, pressuring the center, not stepping into a pin. <clears throat> yeah, that's much better. Right. right. So this is where I would challenge you, Mike, but I'm giving you a lot of grief today and I don't want to push my luck, about how much time did you spend on queen c2? And if you tell me that it was more than five, then I would have a long list of questions starting with, okay, if you look at the position, do you agree with me? It's blatantly obvious that we need to get the queen out so the troops are connected. Yes. Okay. You have got three squares to go to. Yes. One is hanging. No go. Yes. So we are reduced to two within 30 seconds. Yes. Okay. Which one seems to put more pressure on the opponent? B3. Any reasons why we shouldn't go there? None. Okay. That's it. Now, it well, shouldn't yeah. happen at this speed when you are playing chess. No, but I, the thought I, I get, process I to... is exactly this. Right. I will come to you. Yeah. Then. Okay, so that's how you think. And even if you go, do you go like, okay, queen b3 looks quite good, but let's see what queen c2 does. And you go like, mm, it's quite passive. That diagonal, yeah, I've got nothing to do there. Oh, hang on. C file, yeah. Only semi-open file for black on the board. Rook almost inevitably is going there. Mm, nah, I hate my But you life. know what? If if I if I'm remembering correctly now, then you know it wasn't just sort of like picking between two lines for me. I'm just explaining my thought process in hopes that it it helps. The um, I was also thinking about uh, knight uh, knight two b three, and if I go to queen c uh, b three then it takes that square away from that knight. Now, I don't know, you know, and I, I sort of like in my head am debating all this stuff. And this is why it takes a long time for me. Right, uh, bear with me for a second, Mike. Honey? Sure. I'm having a lesson, I can't hear what you're saying. I will be with you in 10 minutes, go. Um, did you see a knight here? Yeah. Okay, now let, let's go, go back to that. You do realize, Mike, that currently this pawn is under attack by two. and you are guarding it by two. And your plan is to release this guard to come here for reasons that I haven't yet asked. Right, right. And so we, your actual proposed plan is a, pawn, a blunder. Now, queen c2 doesn't fix it, really, because even if you, I don't play rook here, but let's just for the argument's sake, I play this dumb ball here, you still wouldn't play knight b3 here, A, because it doesn't do anything, and B, because now I'm going to Worst case scenario, trade knight for bishop, which we desperately hate, but you would actually lose a piece on this pin. Right, right. So this shouldn't come up in the first place as a plan because you realize that you need a guard on this. 
if you want to refine it, you could argue that, okay, then I first take, and then I go there, which would still be the wrong square, by the way, because your knight does absolutely nothing on b3. Spectacularly misplaced piece. But you would actually realize that after knight takes his bishop again, can't avoid the trade for the knight, which again, we desperately hate. Right, now, I see. I do agree with you that of all your pieces, d2 is the worst place. But that's not your biggest problem now. Your biggest problem now is that your rooks need to be connected. And if anywhere, Mike, this knight is going to come here, because guess what? We want to contest the center. You tell me what this knight contests from here. Uh, right, right. Yeah. No, I, I just sort of uh, was explaining why I was... Yeah, and I, I do understand that, but then I wanted to clarify that that planning altogether was faulty. Right, right. Agreed. Agreed. Dude, I'm so proud of you. I'm giving you so much grief. Now this was quite good because my constant go-to is that when you are down, try to stir the pot. You're down a pawn, you have got a weak pawn here, you actually gave two question marks to this move, but I would be a little bit more lenient in this case for the first time in history because you need to somehow stir them up. You need to create scenarios where they can blunder. If they want, you are going to lose but it's a lost position. So that's what we reckon with, we are going to lose. So now if you try to play moves that stir the pot, that's quite good. So for that reason, I really am liking what, what I'm seeing at this stage. And good choice again, let's avoid the queen trade. That's very good. Right. So th this is good stuff here, sadly we got secured though. Yeah. That's where the, well, after all, we were still that lost haunts us. Okay, so this looks to me like a blunder, but once again, we are dead lost, so it shouldn't matter. And then the piece was gone, and uh, with that, so was the game. I'm not going to get into that now. So, um, let's give you a quick summary to this, Mike, because I want you to see what I see and where we are heading. Um, yeah. You see that quite a few of your openings are actually reasonably sound, and you are playing it at least on the level of your opponents. Some were totally off like this one, but some were fine. We are definitely going to get into opening lines because that at least will prevent you ever losing in an opening without you know, firing a bullet. And actually, we'll also then open up a lot of avenues for you because once you have a, a sound base to build on, then you will have a lot of far more playable positions when you can continue from there. Right, the only right. concern with openings is that it's a very, very, very time-consuming affair. In fact, of the three phases of the game, opening, middle game, end game, that is the most time-consuming by nature. I'm not saying that that deserves the most time, but when you spend time on it, you, t you, you can literally spend weeks and weeks and weeks on one opening trying to master it, and we are playing like 50 of them. So I could literally right. give you opening lessons for the rest of the year, so I have to play a very fine balancing act in, um, you know, giving you a bit of this, but at the same time polishing our tactics, polishing our endgame technique, so that the whole picture falls into place at the right amount. Right, okay, I understand. So that and being said, we are going to build a, a repertoire around what you're currently are doing. So we are going to keep e4, we are going to keep e4, e5 is black. Um, and that already is going to make you a fairly solid backbone uh, to get onto. Right. Okay? Right. So yep. th that is my grand plan, but once again, it's unlikely that we are going to spend whole lessons on opening zombies. Okay, yeah, I, maybe I'd, I, I don't think we necessarily need to do that because I think you're right, it is sort of no. my work that I need to do. Yeah, I just may have... Exactly, so considering how hardworking you are, we are going to do some and then I'm going to send you the rest and that will be then up to you what you do with it. It sounds a bit douchebaggy, but as I told you, learning openings is really a private affair. Like, you, even if I drive you through and talk you through the whole entire file, you would have to then go through again yourself because there's no other way to memorize it. Yeah, yeah, I agreed, yeah. yeah. So uh, That's fine, yeah. I, I guess I was just sort of try, trying to say that I, I have finally gotten to the point where it, it is making 
more openings are making more sense to me. That's it. And that was exactly my intention by teaching you basic opening principles because Absolutely. that's the only way how they make sense. Right. And I'm saying it's it's definitely has has been working. And you know, like, you know, I'm an adult, so it's going to take me a long time to oh, don't to be so hard on yourself. I'm here for that. Yeah. So that's that's but my I mean, job to you know, be hard on you, Mike. You you can yeah. go easy. No, he won't. I don't think so. I don't think so. You you, you will see that uh, if we keep it uh, sensible and sensibly narrow, then you will get your head around them quite quickly. Especially because you actually do play a lot, which is brilliant. Because that means that they are get they, they get tested on a regular basis, and so even by playing them, you will become better at them. Yeah. Do, do you know what what I what is a question now, and I. I it's just a matter of like my my free time uh, and whether or not I so basically my practice games because they're taking me about an hour each um, yeah. the ones I do on chess yeah those because these past couple of weeks um, I've had less time you know and I go busy times and less times uh, yeah. throughout the year that 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 is the thing that is suffering in lieu of study on openings you know because I still like to keep my tactics work up. Yeah. And all that Look, uh, I was going to address that problem anyway, um, and that hopefully is going to again kill more than one bird by the same stone. Because of you seem to struggle with time issues, I wanted you to play some limited time control games as well. And they okay. serve the purpose of practicing your openings just as well as a long term game. Because in the early phase, regardless of the time control, you are going to play the same openings. So instead of playing 30 30s or 30 whatever, cut it back to 10 2. No, 10 2's taken out. Uh, well, 15 15 is what I've been playing. Those take an hour. Fine. 15 15 is, can go way too long. So cut it down to 8 5 or 8 2 or 8 1. Or, and here I'm going I've, to push I've, you to the limit, play a few games without increment. Ah. Uh, play a 10 0. No harm, oh, I you definitely know that it's going to end at the absolute latest in 20 minutes. So if you have got an hour, you know that you can play three 10 tens at least without any dramas. I see. And that I is see. going to address definitely your mental strength and your thinking because there, there is, you know, eating up time is an unforgivable sin. And I don't try to make you a fast player because it's quite harmful actually at this stage. But we need to use your time wisely, and I'd rather you play three games where we can practice three different openings than play one and then not necessarily find that many weaknesses, problems, issues, and so on. Okay. Uh, okay. Saying that in light that I do know that you play over the board other than this. So it's a better use to spend your leeches time than on a different angle of your game, if you will. Okay, understood. That sounds like that sounds like a good plan. Alrighty, oh, I I'm full of good plans, Mike. So let's hope that it's going to work out to what I hope it's going to work out to. Um, thank you. I will let you go now. Thank you very okay. much for your patience and thank you for not hanging up on me halfway through. That's very generous of you, and I mean it. Um, <laughs> I wish you best of luck, and I actually may send you some stuff to work on openings wise in the meantime. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, think things lighten up for me in two weeks again, work-wise. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was uh, I, I had to bring this up also. I, I know probably not, but I just wanted to remind you in case there is a is some other time that opens up in your schedule, it's a little easier for me to uh, you know that this early morning is very difficult. Right. But uh, um, we will talk but I'll keep about it as long as possible. Later. Uh, yeah. I will try to find something for you. As you know, I'm juggling time just as I understand. I understand. Uh, my time management is yours, but uh, I will yeah. try to, to, to figure yeah. out something. And, and, and like I said, if this is all we got, this is what we got then. You know, like that's, uh, that's I, okay. I really appreciate your loyalty in this department, Mike. I will try to, to do something to make it happen. Okay. Thank you so much, Alrighty. Coach Andra. My I appreciate pleasure, it. my friend, and I hope to see you next week. See you next week. Alrighty. Thank you, mate. See ya. Bye. Take care. Bye.